I didn't make it by myself. Anybody who tells you that they made things by themselves completely is not telling the truth. Somewhere around the line, they, there were people who helped them. I was a very bright little girl, but I chose my parents well. And I had great teachers, and I had different people around me. Because a Yorba proverb says, even the sharpest blade can't cut its own handle. You know, we all need help. And that's what I want to talk about today, is how do we make the future the world that we want to live in? It's because we can't, no one person's going to be able to do it. It's going to require all of us to do it. Let's just do a little bit of what I'm going to call perspectives on all of this. When you think about it, there's a world that's happening right now. And people will always say, you know, you've heard people say, don't worry about it, it's going to all work out for the best. you heard people say that, right? That's nonsense. <laughs> Unless we have extraordinarily good karma, it's not just going to work out. We have a role in what happens. And right now, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, the STEM fields, are cutting a wide swath through things. I'm just going to tell you really quickly, with 100 Year Starship, we do lots of different projects from public symposia, which we call Nexus, to working on interstellar writing, Center for Advanced Aerospace Manufacturing, helping to visualize what advanced aerospace manufacturing looks like for a community college curriculum, right? Because those vehicles are not built by four-year degree folks. They're built by technicians. And one of the things we've done was of what were called crucibles, where we want to jumpstart different disciplines. And I'm going to just, I'm going to stop right here and be able to try to move forward. Because with these crucibles, we're looking at how do you try to get a discipline started that we don't know we need right now? One of the, our first one was called the virtual human which was done in a castle outside of Gross, Austria. And what we did was bring in people who actually thought this up, who had never been involved in space exploration before. They were subject matter experts in life sciences. And they said, what we need to do in order to create a better vision and capabilities for deep space is to wholly model human health and physiology to such an extent that you could run a clinical trial on your model. They weren't concerned about the effects of weightlessness so much. But they said, as you get further and further from Earth, you cannot count on its medical infrastructure. You can't carry enough antibiotics with you. Things are going to change. You're going to have different epidemiology. So the critical factor is replicating, having a means of having that infrastructure in place. That's what happens when you have different people involved. I'm going to split through some slides really fast. I want to just show you some of the pictures of people who are involved. Well, I'll go back. Space isn't just for rocket scientists and billionaires. It requires lots of different people. We have folks from who, folks who were like Amy Millman, who helped to develop Springboard. She says she knows nothing about space, but she does know how to raise money. And she has someone, she helps women-owned companies, uh, tech companies, raise money. And her company has raised over 10, I think, no, $8 billion over the last 10 years. Lou Friedman, who helped co-found this planetary society. Carl Espelon, who's a professor of textile and design at uh, University of Rhode Island. He's the one who came in, never being involved in space, said, you have to rethink clothing. He agreed with polyester. <laughs> uh, yeah, we do have astronomers, astrophysicists, Hakeem Olashehi, uh, who is an uh, astrophysicist, and Jill, Dr. Jill Tarter. Who's, all, who's an astronomer. Jill Tarter was a co-founder of the SETI Institute back in the 1970s, as anyone saw the Carl Sagan movie, Contact. Um, she's the character Jodie Foster, she's a person Jodie Foster's character was based on. And Hakeem called Jill the OG of Interstellar, <laughs> because the original gangster, because she started SETI in the 1970s when it was really something that people didn't talk about. Jenny Young, who is the developer of something called the Beautiful Life Development Plan Foundation in Shanghai, China, which doesn't look at space, but how do we learn to live on this earth? The artist and re resident at SETI, Casey Hudson, who was a developer of Mass Effect video game. Because you have to tell, the, somebody was asking me about how do you tell the story. 
Video games tell incredible stories and rally people. We do look at stories, science fiction night. If you look back in the back, you can see LeVar Burden and some science fiction authors. There's Mary Doria Russell, who if anybody, best science fiction novel maybe ever in space is The Sparrow. But uh, LeVar Burden is part of it. And that's Dr. Ronkio Labisi, who's our resident uh, sci-fi expert and critic, and she's a professor of textile, I mean, I'm sorry, of biomedical engineering at Rutgers. And then finally, I wanted to show you a picture of Mbonani Mfuhe, who is a deputy director of the Department of Science and Technology in South Africa. I'm showing you this picture because Mbonani has within his portfolio something called the, um, the Square Kilometer Array, which is going to be the world's largest radio telescope. This telescope is going to collect more data than the internet does. It's going to be built in, a major part of it's going to be built in southern Africa. And Mbanani says people often ask him, why would he, or why would South Africa work on something like the world's largest radio telescope when they have problems with poverty and money and other, and other things and housing? And he said, because it's about dreams. Everybody dreams. Even a person who lives in a mud hut and sleeps on a floor without any cover, they dream of big things. They don't just dream of food, they dream about the world. And the dreams are our hope. And that's what we have to live with. And so this is what I believe in. I believe that there's a better future. And what we really want to do is to create a future where we inspire collective ambition for humanity. How do we come together and think of ourselves as Earthlings? And I'm going to leave you with the idea that one of the things we want to do in 20 18 in August 2018 is have a day when around the world we all look up and imagine and understand that we look at the same sky. Can we create a tapestry of what we see around the world for 24 hours? If we don't figure out we're earthlings, we are going to have problems. But we can look up and try to think about how do we unify things. And I think space exploration, space itself has that possibility to help us look outward, and at the same time, see ourselves. Thank you all very much.